30 seconds. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to AB 1234 Ethics Training. Uh, my name is Chris Newmeyer. I'm your city attorney. And I have with me here today your assistant city attorney, Lana Lehman. And thank you for being here for two hours of required ethics training. We will try to make it as entertaining and informational as possible. And we ask you actually can also take questions uh, during the training if you'd like. Um, we want to make sure we get through all of the required material um, at the request of the city clerk and uh, the setup for recording. We have a microphone over here. So if you have a question, then please come up and you can ask on there. So how many of you have done this training before? Okay. Well, there are, you all can go. You can get your two hours. And uh, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, state law requires you got to do this uh, when you enter office. And then after that, you got to do it every two years. So here we are. And we'll get in during the training. For those of you who've been here before, you might remember that this all started because of a big ethical scandal in Sacramento um, where there was a lot of... Um, alleged corruption on uh, ethical violations, and there was some reports in the Sacramento Bee, and Assembly Bill 1234 came out of that, and so now there's this mandatory training. Uh, this was the Sacramento Water District. Uh, the question was, was this Gray Davis? Um, I'm sure uh, we could have some ethical examples, too, for all of our past governors. <laughs> um, so. I'm going to start with the presentation here. We have about 90 slides to go through, so two hours, and Lana and I will uh, actually switch off for some of the material. So the session objectives, it's to familiarize you with the laws that govern your service and when to ask questions, and to encourage you to think beyond legal restrictions and provide tools for doing so. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, and Lana and I will be talking about ethical laws here today. Um, ones that basically can get you in trouble with the state uh, in terms of criminal and civil penalties. But we're also encouraging you to uh, think beyond the laws and think about just ethical principles and then that you're the judge of whether or not those ethics are involved in situations you have. But we'll talk about some of the common situations. Um, and of course, to help you comply with the state mandated requirements of two hours of training. So it's a two hour session. Uh, questions, of course, you're free to ask questions. And at the end, you'll get a certificate and you will sign that hopefully and turn that into the city clerk and she'll keep that on file and you'll be done with your required training. So ethics laws versus ethics. Uh, again, as I was mentioning, law is often the starting point for ethical analysis and the law is what we must do. But just because it's legal, doesn't mean it is ethical or the public will perceive it to be so. And so ethics are what we should do. And again, I'm not here to teach ethics. I'm here to talk about common ethical situations that public servants face. So the Attorney General of California has said that there are four basic areas that should be covered in this training. And that's trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, and fairness. And the idea is that these four concepts promote public trust in government, and uh, following these avoids even an appearance of impropriety. And so uh, I want you to take a look at this list here and just ask yourself, you don't have to answer out loud. For those of you who have done this training before, uh, you remember this test. Um, ask yourself, are you always ethical? Are you mostly ethical? Somewhat, seldom, or never. Now, most people will say they're always or mostly ethical. That's the normal response. And now, as a public servant, you got to ask yourself the question now, how would other people rate you? Would the public think that you're always, mostly, somewhat, seldom, or never? And the point of this exercise is to understand that public trust in local government is important for it to be able to function. And so what the public perception is also counts. And so how we create that public perception of there is ethical local government is applying these rules, knowing these rules, 
understanding, you know, when these conflicts arrive, ethical conflicts, um, you know, being open and transparent about it. And that allows local government to function uh, the way it's intended to. So here's some rationalizations for unethical conduct. Uh, it was necessary, it was legal, won't hurt anyone, everyone's doing it, et cetera. So there's always reasons for justifying unethical conduct. And as I've been emphasizing, uh, the purpose of ethics laws is to protect the public's trust in the institutions and the individuals that serve them. And uh, remember that, as I said, perception's important. Uh, your gut is not always a reliable guide because there's a lot of uh, complicated rules that the Fair Political Practices Commission has issued, uh, Sacramento has issued, um, there's some court cases that have issued rules, and so, you know, your gut's a good, I guess, uh, uh, direction finder, but it's not always going to give you the right answer. And a lot of ethical violations, at least legal ones, they don't involve bad intentions. It's that somebody just didn't think it through, and then at the last minute they go ahead and participate in a decision when maybe they should have talked to the attorney or the city clerk or city manager before and find out if they should recuse themselves, et cetera. They didn't fill out the right paperwork and report on you know, Form 700 you know, items they should have reported. It's not necessarily bad faith, but the point is, is gut's not a reliable guide per se. You want to make sure that you keep these rules in mind. Um, and the basic point here on that is uh, the little phrase, if in doubt, send it out, uh, which means that if you have doubt about a possible ethical issue, then send it out to City Hall, uh, ask. And if you uh, feel uncomfortable asking City Hall, um, there's also resources where you can call anonymously the FPPC and ask them a question. If you don't want to contact City Hall, um, you can also email them. So um, if in doubt, send it out to somebody. And we're always available to confer with any of you on any ethical questions you have about some conflict that might come up. So understanding ethics laws, um, what they cover, when you need to ask questions, resources for further reference. Uh, this is what we're going to be going over today. And there's four basic groups uh, that we'll be discussing. Personal financial gain, personal advantages and perks, governmental transparency, and fair processes. And so I'll be going over groups one and three. And then your assistant city attorney, Lana Lehman, will be going over uh, sections two and four. So personal financial gains. Uh, public servants should not benefit financially from their positions. I think that that's common sense. We all know that. Um, but what does that actually mean? And frankly, this is some of the easy part of the section to go over. Um, we all know that bribery is illegal. Um, but there's also financial interest disqualification requirements. And so if you have a financial interest in decisions you're making and there's rules for figuring that out, then that's not a bad thing. It just means you need to recuse yourself from participating in that decision. And, and it happens. Uh, I mean, otherwise, you probably wouldn't be involved if you didn't have other involvement in the community. Um, there's also revolving door restrictions for council members and for uh, top managers. There's a one-year prohibition on turning around and becoming a lobbyist um, after you've ended your service. So that can apply um, after your service. So what is bribery? Uh, bribery is conferring a benefit on a public official to influence a person's vote, opinion, action, or inaction. And penalties can be loss of office, prison time, fines, restitution, attorney's fees, public embarrassment, and also, the person offering the bribe, of course, can be criminally charged, convicted as well. So it goes both ways. So now we get to a case study. Um, this is an interesting one, and it's still ongoing. Um, regardless of whether or not this mayor of Palm Springs is finally going to be vindicated in the court, the fact that this has been going on since uh, 2017, and it's still dragging its way through the courts, indicates that just your life being turned upside down even if you were in questionable circumstances, but you didn't break the law, like that can be a problem. But we don't know where this case is gonna go. Um, but the former mayor of Palm Springs was alleged to have accepted uh, $375,000 in bribes 
from two developers. Um, this was, he was charged back in 2017. And in 2019, a grand jury came out and uh, found that there were 30 counts of bribery, perjury, conspiracy to commit crime. Um, he had some good attorneys or he had the truth on his side, take your pick, but he got a court to throw out the charges. That went up to the appellate court. The appellate court reinstated the charges. And now, uh, I just checked this the last few days, um, now it's been rescheduled for April 2023 for another hearing at the court level. So this has been going on for five years. And, um, you know, innocent until proven guilty, we don't know what the outcome's gonna be. But um, interesting case study here on uh, this situation. This one, there actually was a conviction, 2017, uh, City of Westminster in Orange County. A federal jury convicted David Vo, former planning commissioner, of one count of bribery. Uh, he accepted $15,000 in exchange for influence to get a liquor license. And um, interesting uh, quote from the court decision. The judge said, to line his pockets, Vo made a calculated decision to help a bribe payer at the expense of law-abiding members of the community who sought conditional use permits and liquor licenses through legitimate channels. Prosecutors wrote this in a sentencing memorandum filed with the court. In so doing, Vole sold his influence on the planning commission, giving, as he called it, inside access for under the table money. That conduct reflects a profound breach of the public's trust. So here's a clear example of uh, what obviously you shouldn't be doing. And like I said, I'm, I'm sure we all know that bribery is unlawful. We'll be getting into some more of the nuanced areas once we get past these original ones. Another example, 2014, Marino Valley, a uh, former council member pled guilty to accepting $2.36 million bribe from an undercover FBI agent. Uh, this one is just kind of mind blowing. Um, this guy was caught on videotape getting stacks of cash. I mean, the FBI had those little cameras and like, you know, he had stacks of $100 bills being brought in and uh, it was a sting operation. And he was selling his vote to rezone land which was going to supposedly make the land go up millions of dollars in value for the rezoning. And so another example of bribery, five years in prison. A similar crimes to bribery, extortion. Um, extortion, of course, is when, uh, you know, people call it shakedowns. Um, it's a criminal offense of obtaining money, property services um, through coercion. Uh, letting people know you're not going to do something unless they pay you. So it's, it's soliciting bribes, if you will, in a roundabout way. Um, receiving rewards for appointing someone to office. And embezzlement, converting public funds or property to your own. Um, all of these obviously are unethical and they're illegal. So now we get into the ones that aren't so obvious. And this is where... Uh, you want to make sure when you're making your decisions that you consider your financial interests and how they impact your decisions. So the rule is you may not participate in a decision if financial interests are affected by it. But what does that mean? Well, and this doesn't help that much either. Uh, then the law goes on to say, a public official has a disqualifying financial interest if the decision will have a reasonably foreseeable material financial effect distinguishable from the effect on the public generally, directly on the official or his or her immediate family. That helps a bit, but again, you know, you probably notice attorneys love the word reasonably. That's how we always not give a straight answer. Uh, we'll say something is reasonably this, reasonably that. So it has to have a reasonably foreseeable material financial effect. And it can be positive or negative. Um, I've always thought... Uh, it's interesting the law says uh, negative as well. I mean, I, I assume that that would mean a no vote. Uh, it's gonna affect your finances negatively, but um, it's usually the positive effects that folks are looking at. So we'll get into some of the details on what that all means, but I wanna say in the beginning that disqualification versus abstention. We're gonna talk about when the law requires you to not participate in a decision. And to give an example, if you're on planning commission and uh, a CUP comes up before uh, the planning commission or any type of permit or entitlement or license, and you have a financial interest in the party that's coming before you, and we're gonna talk about when that occurs, then you would be disqualified from participating and you would just not participate in the decision. Um, 
Now, sometimes the law doesn't require you to recuse yourself, but you feel that you have a strong personal bias, and that's when you can abstain. And you can just say, I'm not going to participate in this decision. Um, I have, you know, too, too many strong feelings about this, or I have a personal interest in this. Um, that sometimes happens. So that's the difference between disqualification versus abstention. So what kind of interests? These are the financial interests that matter. Uh, it's whether it's reasonably foreseeable and it will have a material effect. And so the key here is that it doesn't have to absolutely affect your uh, financial interests. And going back to the example of the permit coming to planning commission, if the business seeking the permit, you own the business, well, obviously, whether or not the permit is granted, you have a financial interest, and so you would want to recuse yourself. Um, if your uh, spouse owned the business, you would have a financial interest. Um, now, interestingly, you start to get into stuff like sources of income. Like, if you get a large source of income, if they're your employer, then you might have a financial interest. And the effect doesn't have to be 100%. Um, certainty is not the issue. It's that it's reasonably foreseeable that it could affect you. And so here's the actual four-part test. Um, this is what the attorneys will go through if you say, hey, do I have a conflict or not? The first question, is it reasonably foreseeable that there'll be a financial effect? And if that's the case, for example, uh, a permit is uh, before the planning commission and uh, you have an involvement in the business, you don't own it, but you do get some money from it. Okay, so um, if we conclude that step one is passed, then we ask step two, is it material? And we have some tests for how much money is involved. And then step three, even if steps one and two are met, if this is going to have basically an effect on the entire public, uh, a large part of the public, um, and we get into those rules, it can be 15 to 25 percent, then you can still make the decision. And the obvious example is when the city is uh, trying to put together, say, a new general plan, obviously every council member and every planning commissioner is going to be impacted by it uh, because they live in the city. And so that's an example of public generally. Like you don't have every planning commissioner and council member recuse themselves from working on the general plan because it affects the entire city. So public generally, step three, we take a look at that. And then step four, if we get to that point, um, it, it's not affecting the public generally, there's a material financial effect and it's reasonably foreseeable it'll happen, then you need to recuse yourself from the decision. So what are the bright line rules for these financial interests? Um, if you receive $500 or more from this interest that's coming before you, then that's an income interest. Uh, if it's a business or real property and you have $2,000 or more invested in it, that's a business or real property interest. And we also have, um, and it can be confusing because the FPPC keeps changing the rules, uh, but as of now, there is what we call the 500-foot rule. If you own real property within 500 feet of another real property that's coming to you for some sort of entitlement, license, permit, or decision, then it's presumed that there's a conflict. So if you're within 500 feet of it, you just shouldn't vote on it. You should recuse yourself. If it's between 500 and 1,000 feet, we have to look at a number of factors. It's not assumed, but you might not want to participate and we can go through the analysis. If it's over a thousand feet, then it's assumed there isn't a conflict, but still sometimes there can be. Um, when I say that they keep changing the rules, it used to just be a flat 500 foot rule. It used to just be if it's under 500 feet, then you got a conflict. Um, otherwise, uh, if it was over, you didn't, but now you got this maybe, maybe not thing, but we can still remember if it's within 500 feet. Yes? Do you, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you mind going to the mic? Yeah, we just want to capture this for the uh, the video. I just bring this up to clarify. Sure. If a property, let's say it's a large property, 50 acres, 500 acres, uh, and there's a proposed project on one acre of that property, but it's one APN for the whole property, uh, but the project is on one little tiny corner of it, define what constitutes the 500 foot 
Sure, that's a really good question. Um, so that would require analysis, and so there's a good chance taking a look at everything that if the uh, actual parcel is say, you know, 100 acres, and then up on the northeast corner, there's like a small uh, uh, project being developed, uh, and there's n nothing in between, then I would say that you wouldn't go from the parcel line, you would go from the development line for the 500 foot. But it would depend upon the specific situation. Does that answer the question? Okay. Subjective, yes. It is subjective in my mind. There would have to be case law that would substantiate your subjective conclusion. Yes, it, it, it would depend upon an analysis of the factors on like how big that development is and Let's whether- say it's a really big development. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would, I would need to look at the facts of what's going on. It depends how big the parcel is. I mean, if the APN is only two acres and then, you know, one and a half acres of it was being used, then uh, it depends on how much of the rest of it's being used. But so the answer is basically come to you and ask. Yes. <laughs> and uh, sorry, I can't have a clearer answer. I uh, know that um, it gets frustrating we don't have these bright line rules uh, on some of these, but this is one of the more um, uncertain areas on real property impacts. But it's a really good question. That comes up, the question you asked. So other interests we have, um, so gifts, and uh, that would just be somebody providing you, obviously, with uh, not for employment or not for uh, a contract, but just a gift. Um, you need to report gifts that are over five hundred, over fifty dollars, and you have a limit of five hundred and ninety dollars for gifts. Now, let me be clear: this isn't gifts like with family and friends. Um, this isn't normal gift uh, giving. So, if somebody gives you a gift and it's part of just your routine social relationship with them, that you also might give them gifts. For example, during the holidays or birthdays. Don't worry about this. But if suddenly you have a new friend because you're a public official and they want to give you a, a gift of a new television or a new car, uh, that's when the problem kicks in. So um, I know there can be confusion on this gift rule where people are like, well, wait a minute, like what about birthdays or holidays? Like that's not what I'm talking about. It's if the person is not in a gift giving relationship with you. Um, and in that case, you need to report it uh, if it's over $50 and then you're capped out at five ninety. Yes? <clears throat> I'm a little bit confused about the five ninety. So that's the end of it? What happens after? Well, at that point, you're in violation of the FPPC regulations. So, whatever, so whatever's it, 591 and above, then that's... The it, should be, it should be given back or donated to a okay. charity. Okay. Yeah. So, um, an example here of a conflict, uh, failure to recuse and disclose. So we've talked about these conflicts uh, when you have a decision that comes up to you on your commission committee or board. And if you have a conflict, it's okay to step down and recuse yourself. I mean, you're involved in the community. People have conflicts. What happens if you don't? Uh, Simon Lee was an alternate commissioner on the city of San Marino's planning commission. Uh, and this individual is also on the city's design review committee for four years. While on the design review committee, he voted twice in favor of applications submitted by his own clients. So he had a source of income from these folks. And he failed to also disclose it on his statement of economic interests. And so he was fined $10,000. So he had two violations here. He didn't report this on his Form 700s, and he also didn't recuse himself when his clients came up for a decision before him. And all he had to do was do the paperwork, it's not a ton of paperwork, and then just recuse himself, but he didn't, so $10,000 fine. So I talked about how even if you have a conflict, sometimes the public generally exception uh, means that the conflict is not something you need to recuse yourself for. 
And so you don't have a conflict if over 25% of the public has the same issue or there's a special exception for um, you don't have a conflict if it's 15% and that is just for residential real property. And if your residential real property where you live, um, if that is impacted by a decision, but it also impacts 15% or more of the city, then you don't have a conflict. But the general rule of thumb is one quarter, one quarter of the city. And so this issue sometimes comes up with decisions, say, down on the Embarcadero. Um, and we got to figure out, you know, is the decision impacting a quarter of the city or not? Um, if we have something involving the downtown. Um, now, like I said, when you have the general plan, when it's the entire city, uh, then that's something that affects everybody. But this rule does come into play for large scale projects um, and whether or not it affects over a quarter of the city. Yes? That would be interesting. So if you were rezoning some aspect of the commercial district house, maybe a block or two from the main boulevard, but the main boulevard stretch for a mile. Um, yes, uh, you might, but if the impact would be on the quote public generally, so uh, for your home, if 15% of the city also has that conflict, theoretically. So, so the way to look at it is uh, if, if, over, if, if everybody in the city was, say, on the planning commission, and 15% of them would have the same conflict, then uh, you get the public generally exception, um, if it's your home. If it's not involving your home, if it's anything else, then it's 25%. And this you know, rule is to make sure that you can have people like that can make these decisions. Because obviously, if you didn't have this public generally, then some decisions could never be made when you get up to like 70, 80, 90%. And so what's the relevant time period? These conflicts don't last forever. Um, so it's 12 months before the decision. So if you have a, a former business client uh, that comes to your commission committee or board, and it's over 12 months, then that conflict doesn't exist. So it doesn't go on forever. And it's not the calendar year, it's it's 12 month clock. Now let's say you do have a conflict. And again, I wanna emphasize, there's nothing untoward about having a conflict, it happens. Um, the issue is whether or not you're gonna recuse yourself. And if you do that, you're fine. So what do you do? Don't discuss or influence staff or your colleagues for the conflict and then at the meeting, you wanna just say, I have a conflict because uh, I have a property at, you know, the, I have a property within the limits that would be impacted by this, or, you know, I have a business interest with the applicant, you know, just, just give a brief explanation. And then you actually like need to walk off the dais and leave the room. Um, that's a relatively new rule. It used to be you could just sit up there and be quiet, but it sounds like, the FPPC or Sacramento thinks that maybe people do use body language or something, so you gotta leave the room. Um, and this leave the room rule, like I said, that's relatively new. Um, and once you say what your conflict is and you walk away for that item, that's fine. Uh, there's also a new rule where uh, there were people that would have a conflict, they knew they had a conflict, and they would just kinda leave the dais like, at the tail end of the item before, and uh, then they felt they didn't have to announce it because they were like gone for a few minutes before and a few minutes after. So now the rule is that if you're at that meeting at any point in time where you have that conflict issue, even if you miss the item, you have to announce that that item you had a conflict on. If you miss the entire meeting, then you don't need to announce it. But that keeps the loophole of someone wandering off a few minutes before the item and wandering back a few minutes after the item. If you're at the meeting, you have to announce it. Um, limited exceptions. If you fully own the property under discussion, obviously there's a conflict. Or if you fully own the business under discussion, you have a conflict. However, you can just walk around and go get public comment on it now. And you can't always do that, but in some cases you can. So if you fully own it, then you can walk around and do public comment because obviously it directly impacts you. 
you just want to make sure when you do public comment, you say, I'm here speaking as an individual and, you know, resident of the city, I'm not speaking here in my official capacity. Penalties, uh, as you might expect, um, the decision can be invalidated. Uh, you could lose your office. It can be a misdemeanor, fines, attorney's fees, and of course, embarrassment, personal and political. So now we get to special rules for contracts. So this is government code 1090 and um, disqualification isn't enough here. Uh, we've talked about when you need to recuse yourself and just not participate in the decision. This is something where the city just can't enter into a contract if it's with you. It just can't be done. Um, the contract's invalid. And that's if you have a direct or indirect interest in the party that wants to contract with the city. And the penalties are very severe. So if you enter into a contract with the city and it is something that is invalidated, the city gets to keep everything. They get to keep what you paid or what you got and get back what they gave you. And there's a famous example. Um, there was a council member who wanted to sell land to a city and he knew that he can't sell the land directly. So instead he sold it to a middle man and then that middle person sold it to the city. But it was clear from the transaction that the whole intent was to then get it in the city's hands. So the court said, nope, that's a 1090 violation. And the city got to keep the land and they also got to get back the $258,000 that was paid to them. So this is a very strict rule. It's one of the strictest ones that's there. It's government code 1090. So anytime there's a contract personally involving you, um, that basically can't be entered into by the city. Um, if you're the person that is making the contract, so this is on council, or if you're a staff member directly involved in it. So um, I don't want all the commissioners and committees and board members to think that um, it always would apply to them. Um, it's if you're making the contract, you're involved in the making of it. But alarm bells should go off in your head if you're contracting with the city and, and we either can't do it or we need to confirm that this government rule, uh, government code 1090 doesn't apply to you um, because the penalties are very severe. And also it's just one of the ethical rules that um, the state thinks is important. We talked about revolving door prohibitions. Um, so elected officials and top managers uh, can't represent people for pay for a year after leaving their agency. And um, that's one that doesn't come up a whole lot, but uh, sometimes you see it. And then we have a new law on campaign contributions. So this has always been the law for uh, non-council members, and now it's the law for council members. Um, so it's applied evenly across the board. So this new rule that applies to everybody um, is that essentially you can't be getting $250 or more from somebody and then voting on their permit, license, entitlement, or contract. And the way this works is that for the 12 months before a decision, if you're running for elected office in the city, you can't accept $250 or more from someone and then vote on whatever their item is. You have to recuse yourself. Um, if during the proceeding, once it's already started, uh, you know, it's already been agendized, the application's been submitted, you receive the 250, you have to give it back. You can't keep it, it's a violation to actually have it. Um, after the proceeding for 12 months as well, same thing, you have to give it back. So. Um, there's some more nuance to it, but the core rule is that 12 months before, 12 months after a decision, if you're running for elected office in the city, a $250 can campaign donation or more requires either recusal and or you have to give it back. And so today I'm not expecting you all to memorize these rules or to like, you know, have them all perfectly like lined up in your head. I'm just trying to give you some uh, you know, bright line rules to remember. Campaign contribution, 250 bucks, 12 months before or after a decision, uh, it's probably gonna be a problem and, and talk to City Hall or review these rules or I'm always available to talk to you about it. So best practices, uh, avoid temptation, looking at public service as an opportunity for financial gain. Uh, I don't think anyone in here has that 
uh, temptation, but something that Attorney General talks about saying. Um, but, but something to look at is review every decision you're making and ask yourself, does it involve some kind of financial interest for you? I mean, that's the basic like acid test here. Does your decision impact your wallet or your purse? If it does, then there might be a conflict. And in that case, you might need to recuse yourself. And that's the core rule here on conflicts. And so now we're on group two, uh, perks. And I'll turn it over to Assistant City Attorney Lana Lehman. Here's the clicker, take it away. Good evening. So do I point it at this or uh, forward back? Um, there you go. Mm -hmm. There we go. So now we're going to talk about a body of legislation that started in the 1970s with the Political Reform Act. Political Reform Act is a huge area of law. A lot of the um, laws that Chris was talking about are also part of the uh, Political Reform Act. The Political Reform Act applies to local elected officials, designated employees of local government agencies, uh, in other words, uh, those individuals required to uh, file a Form 700 and a candidate uh, for office for any of those uh, uh, positions. Uh, the FPPC is uh, constantly changing the rules in this area and in some of your areas as well. Uh, in the last four years, just with respect to gifts and perks, they've created over 25 new rules just on the subject of gifts alone. Uh, it's, uh, you, you can find, go to the FPPC website, they have forms, gift limits, and they have summaries of, of all of their gift rules. We can't go over all of them, we're just providing an, inner, uh, an overview tonight. Uh, while, as, as Chris said, yes, you should trust your gut, but it's not always trustworthy. The best thing to do is always ask questions. If you are receiving gifts that make you wonder, hmm, I'm not sure if I'd want to see this on the front page news. So you have two types of uh, gift or perk rules. You know, perks that others give you. In other words, gifts or perks that you give yourself, which is what is technically considered a, a use of public resources or uh, the unlawful usurpation of public resources. So gifts in the traditional sense, that is perks that other are for you. There is a, uh, Chris touched a, uh, upon this briefly, there is an important difference between reportable gifts versus gift prohibitions. Reportable gifts means you must report all gifts of $50 or more on your Form 700 uh, Statement of Economic Interest. The gift uh, prohibitions, uh, currently at the $590 limit, you cannot receive a single gift or a series of gifts worth $590 or more from a single source within the 12 month period. And you cannot make a decision uh, regarding a person or entity that gave you $590 in gifts in the last year. Uh, these limits do change, they escalate uh, they, they do escalate annually uh, or just over time. Uh, so please be aware of that and regularly check with the city clerk with regard to what the latest gift limits are. Uh, as Chris did mention before, we're not talking about gifts from family or friends for say Christmas or, or birthday or uh, a, a wedding gift. Gifts do not uh, always have bows, which means they do not have to be tangible money or goods. Free services or discounts are also treated as gifts. Uh, a common question is, for example, discounts. Let's say if you have baseball tickets and it's a hundred dollar valued at a hundred dollar ticket. Uh, if somebody was to give an official or a planning or a commissioner or a committee member. Uh, a sale of that $100 ticket for $60, they've given them a $40 discount. That is a $40 gift. However, because it's under $50, you don't you, you, it's, not, it's not reportable. But you can see how if that discount was to equal over uh, uh, $50 or hit the reportable limits, it would be a reportable gift. And of course, discounts that start to get upwards of the 
590, you start to look at the possible prohibition limits. Uh, as Chris mentioned, if you have a gift that you think you may have a problem with, or if our office or, or uh, any agency determines that you have a problem with the gift, uh, you can give it back unused in 30 days, and that wipes the slate clean. Uh, you can donate it to somebody else. Uh, or if it's something like a ticket, you can reimburse the giver the actual fair market value of that ticket. So speaking of tickets, uh, tickets or, pa or passes are defined uh, by the FPPC quite broadly. Uh, admission to a facility or event show, performance for entertainment, amusement, recreation, or similar purpose. Uh, free tickets from the city, uh, are, are you, you're, you're usually donated to the city. They generally are gifts, subject to gift limits and, and prohibitions. Um, and normally they are applicable to the Form 700 reporting requirements. Uh, there are some situations where uh, free tickets from the city are not a gift if they're reported to your FPPC Form 802. Uh, and the reporting requirements are, for the exception to apply, the city must have a, they must have a written policy uh, posted on their website that describes the public purpose of the city to be accomplished by the ticket, requires a distribution of the ticket uh, to or at the behest, behest of an official uh, to accomplish a public purpose, and it prohibits the transfer of a ticket to any person outside of the official's immediate family. Uh, if the, 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 the best way to, again, check with your city clerk these policies with regard to uh, gifts and reimbursement and expense reimbursements are regularly updated. If you have a policy, make sure that you familiarize yourself with it. Uh, there is an exception for a ceremonial role. Uh, an act performed at an event by the official as a representative of the city uh, at the uh, request of the holder of the event, say the city, uh, is for, uh, it may, may not be a gift uh, where the act is being performed in the ceremonial or official function of the official. So uh, we, uh, speaking of family, we talked, we talked about getting gifts from family as being accepted uh, from, some of, from the uh, $50, $590 gift prohibitions and reporting requirements. But what about gifts to your family? An official spouse or dependent children are included. So if somebody thinks that they can get around the gifting rules to you in your official capacity just by going and instead uh, gifting to your spouse, well, that's, that's not, that's not going to work. That could potentially fall into a, a, a gift problem and treat it directly as a gift to you. Uh, dependent children includes a child who is 18 to 23, is a student, makes his or her principal residence at the officials uh, with the official, and does not provide over one half of his or her own support. So um, there, there's actually a story behind where this came from. There was an old regulation where the acceptance of college tuition uh, to an official, say 18 year old son or daughter, did not constitute a gift to the official because the, uh, the, the child was not considered a dependent child. Uh, th therefore, it's not a gift. So all of a sudden, if you're a, a, an official, your kids could start getting all these wonderful uh, tuition, <laughs> uh, tuition donations uh, to, to their college. That has been changed. It now does count as a gift. That's why they've changed this definition of what is a dependent child. But no, this does not count as scholarships. They can still accept scholarships. We really are talking about individual gifts to your son or daughter's tuition. So raffles and gifts exchanges. The raffle rule is that a prize donated by an agency employee or purchased with agency funds is not 
reportable by the winner. All other prizes valued at $50 or more may be reportable by either you or by the city. Uh, when an item is provided by an outside donor for a raffle and it's not used for official agency business, the item is treated as payment that confers a personal benefit on the recipient. Otherwise, in other words, it's a gift, it should be treated as such, and it should be reported on your Form 700. This is a, <laughs> this, this is a pretty odd uh, historical relic. The transportation prohibition probably dates back to uh, railroad days when railroads had heavy influence over local government um, for in the first half of the last century. Uh, basically, at this point in time, you, you do not accept any free gifts from regulated, quote unquote, regulated transportation providers. Those would be providers of taxis, airplanes, or buses, for example. Um, no, no honoraria, you should not be receiving uh, fees for writing or speaking. However, the honoraria prohibition does not apply if professional speaking is your primary business or if you give the money to either, say, the general fund or you donate it to a, to a charity. So here, here's a uh, case example, uh, fairly recent, Contra Costa, uh, uh, DA's office. Um, the, in 2017, the FPPC ruled that the uh, district attorney, Mark Peterson, violated the Political Reform Act nine times using campaign funds for 600 personal expenditures. Uh, and, and we're really talking about personal expenditures, groceries, jewelry, movie tickets. Uh, he was fined $45,000 for those uh, expenditures. But then in, in June 2017, the Attorney General's office also decided to go after him and charged him with 12 counts of felony. So now we're moving over to the, the criminal side. Uh, 12 counts of felony perjury and a single count of felony grand theft for uh, allegedly lying on campaign disclosure statements for uh, a period of three years. Uh, Peterson pled no contest uh, and he had to resign his office. Uh, and was also sentenced to three years of informal probation in order to serve 250 hours of community service. 2014 case involving Stone and Youngberg scandal. Uh, Stone and Youngberg was a uh, very big bond firm. They did a lot of municipal bonds for uh, agencies throughout the state. Um, they, they were the underwriter and issued millions of dollars um, and the first indication that there was an issue was somebody reported that they had been giving $2,200 in meals and other gifts to school officials in the city of Powhat. Uh, the, the picture of that building in there, by the way, was built with uh, bonds issued from Stone and Youngberg for the city of Powhat. The, uh, even though this, this, what seems like $2,200 in, in gifts from this bond firm seemed pretty small, the FPPC levied $18,000 in fines uh, and then started a further digging campaign. More than 20 school board members, 30 superintendents agreed to, to pay the fines uh, from the FPPC. And this extended beyond Poway. It, it went from San Diego uh, all the way up to uh, Marin up north. Um, and one thing that's notable is that the FPPC levied those fines, not even necessarily against the public officials who accepted the, uh, the gifts from Stone and Youngberg. They, were e they even had the fines paid by officials who did not accept some of those perks from Stone and Youngberg. The FPPC investigation identified 312 public officials who, accept, who did accept gifts and meals from Stone and Youngberg over the previous four years. Uh, they, they were, uh, most of them were required, were required to report the gifts. Um, only 22 actually did. So what the FPPC investigation uncovered was the fact that 
people can be really bad about actually filling out their reporting requirements, even though that the city clerk has the form, she's, she's ready and willing to help. She has the form right there to help you kind of avoid these kinds of problems. Because when the FPPC decides to bird dog this stuff down, they will, they will really launch a full scale investigation. So penalties uh, up to $5,000 per violation. Um, you can get stuck with attorney's fees. I'll explain that in a second. Um, or the attorney's fees of others. Basically, the Political Reform Act has what's called a, a, a private attorney general statute. So that means if Joe Public sees someone violate and reports to the FPPC, and the FPPC says we're not going to enforce it, that, that uh, reporter, that observer can bring a lawsuit themselves and get their attorney's fees recovered from the public official if the public official is found to have violated the rules. So that's, as a public official, you, you, the, the lesson to take away is that whether you get in, tr get in trouble with the FPPC or whether you get in trouble through somebody's private lawsuit against you, you could get uh, stuck paying not just your attorney's fees, but also the other party's attorney's fees. So use of public resources issues. Um, they, this, I mean, this should be pretty obvious in California, using public resources for either personal or political gain is illegal. Public resources include obviously money, S sounds obvious, but actually it's one of the more common charges you see, especially when you're uh, talking about uh, officials using uh, city credit cards or accounts. Uh, staff time is a, a public resource. Equipment, it could be tools, computers, papers, letterhead, um, vehicles, uh, other supplies like that. Uh, there, I mean, there are some, there's some narrow exceptions for understanding as a, somebody who's in City Hall, using City Hall, you're incidentally going to use the phone occasionally, or you're incidentally going to write on a piece of, uh, city hall paper um, as you're working through the day. Those are incidental uses. You don't, you don't have to worry about those. Uh, expense reimbursements. Uh, familiarize yourself with Moro Bay's uh, policies and limits in terms of what kind of expenses are reimbursable, what rates apply. Um, the, uh, and uh, also note that if you're, say, traveling, the expenses of your spouse or family members or partner who are attending with you, those are not reimbursable. Uh, the uh, core test of whether something is reimbursable is whether it is actual and necessary in, the, in your uh, uh, performance of your official duties. It also requires that the policy can't result in a reimbursement that is more than government per diem. In other words, you can't get reimbursed for more than what you actually pay for. Um, you can get the best information on the uh, expense reimbursement policies, again, from your city clerk. Consequences of uh, violations here, uh, civil penalties of $1,000 per day. Criminal penalties can be upwards of two to four years in prison, uh, plus your disqualification of the, uh, from your office. Can also have in income tax consequences. If you're getting expense reimbursements and they are more than your actual costs and you are misreporting that on your IRS form, you can get into trouble with the IRS. So uh, we have a, another case study. We have a lot of um, these regulations and these rules that thanks to the uh, abuse of some water districts and you know, also to some ex extent some school districts. Uh, this is actually the case that uh, uh, Chris mentioned at the beginning of the presentation where this is really, this was broke by the Sacramento Bee in 2003 originally. 
and led to a huge number of grand jury investigations and also led to the uh, LB, AB uh, 1234 uh, materials that we are, are currently going through. Uh, more recent example, uh, I'm not sure, uh, some, some of you may remember this, it was, uh, it, it was pretty pop, it was pretty big news in the newspapers. <coughs> LA Council member uh, Richard Alarcon was sentenced to 120 days in prison and banned for life from, uh, holding, uh, from holding public office ever again. He went to prison for exchanging political support for cash. He was arrested on uh, suspicion of charging thousands of dollars to the city for motel rooms and calls to phone sex hotlines. So you can imagine why the, uh, uh, why the newspapers had a field day with this one. Uh, Alarcon used city visa to cover 20 motel stays, charged phone sex to the room, also charged nearly $500 on his city-issued cell phone account to calls with party chat lines, uh, which is a good, a, 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 should be a good tip for helping you to remember that your city phone records and your city credit card charges are public records and, uh, can, be, and can be recovered. So it's not hard for a newspaper to dig this stuff up. Uh, Alarcon tw uh, pled guilty to 24 counts of misusing public funds and then was uh, uh, sentenced to the six months in jail. So political use of uh, uh, public resources basically means that public funds and resources cannot be used to expressly advocate for or against a candidate or a measure. For example, it's just as bad to use, say, city stationary for your campaign as it is to use city stationary or, say, a, a city vehicle for your individual personal uh, uh, purposes and needs. The reference to the mass mailing restriction here uh, is that uh, the, the law says it's unlawful to use public resources to enhance your visibility or your name, um, identification with potential voters, this is basically a uh, uh, campaign-related uh, uh, measure. So uh, the, the law forbids sending mass mailings at public expense. The FPPC says that a mass mailing means more than 200 substantially similar pieces of mailings that contain the name, office, or pictures of elected officials uh, within a one month period. So uh, I think a, a, a good basis to make, a, a good way to make sense of this rule uh, is think of it as um, uh, it, it's it, to restrict incumbents' advantages. Just because you're an incumbent shouldn't mean you can get the advantage of putting your name on letter stationary and, uh, and getting a city affiliated advantage at the cost of uh, the, the city and the taxpayers because you're an incumbent. So best practices, avoid perks and the temptation to rationalize taking them. They're legally risky and they can be a real public relations front page nightmare. I had a question about the um, uh, the mass uh, the mass mailings. Um, what's the policy for, uh, let's say, the city to send out election related material in, say, a water bill? Does that fall under that same jurisdiction? And sort of a related question: To what extent can advisory board members or council publicly advocate or oppose uh, an election related item? I'll take that one. Okay. Um, so uh, that's a really good question. Um, the city, when they're uh, sending out information on elections or campaign events, uh, or not campaign events, ballot measures, the city can send out factual information, but they can't advocate a position one way or the other. So for example, um, when the city has had various measures either sponsored by the city or sponsored by citizens, um, it's considered to be in the public interest for factual objective information to be shared with the public. So numbers, 
uh, objective impacts, what would happen if, say, a tax measure doesn't pass and the impact on city revenue. But the city can't advocate and engage in partisan political activity with public funds. So that uh, addresses the mailer question. In regards to individuals taking uh, political stands, uh, you don't leave your First Amendment rights at the door when you become a public servant. What you want to do is make sure that you don't give the impression that you're speaking on behalf of your committee, board, commission, or the council. So uh, you can talk politics all day long as an individual. Just don't say, hey, uh, by the way, I'm a commissioner and this is how my commission, you know, would vote on this. That, that, that is not authorized. It's not appropriate. It's a conflict. And, and don't use public money to do it. <laughs> yeah, and don't use public money. There, there's a cascading effect with these violations where, you know, if one, there's one violation, there's usually a few other ones. And as Lana was talking about, you know, once the FPPC or the DA starts investigating, they don't just stop at that first one. But, um, you know, so they're, they're, it's usually a constellation of violations. There is, yeah, there, I do have another slide. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, w when to ask for help, this really is not just, this is not specific to perks. This should be a theme throughout the entire presentation. Uh, number one, whenever you have doubts. And number two, do not wait for the meeting. These are really complicated. They're very fact specific. I mean, we're, we're probably gonna have a lot of questions about the facts surrounding your scenario that you have concerned about, uh, concern about, and then we have to do the legal research. If you wait until the meeting or just shortly before the meeting, you're going to get the most conservative advice we have. And most likely it's going to be, you should recuse yourself. You should just, you should just assume, unless there is a handy exception we know of right off the top of our head, you should just assume that you're gonna get the most conservative advice uh, possible if you wait till the last minute. There you go. All right. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to see if there's any questions. And if you don't want to walk up to the mic, I can repeat your question if you want to stay in your chair. Uh, any questions or comments or yes? Good question. Uh, the question was whether or not the $50 590 gift limit is per donor or total. It's per donor. Yes? So the question was, is, uh, does all of this apply to city staff as well? Uh, the answer is, is some staff it does, some staff it doesn't. It depends upon uh, basically their executive or manager level and uh, their role in the city. So no, every single employee of the city does not have to follow all these rules. Um, but once you're on a commission committee or board, you're considered to be Brown Act bodies. And so uh, you also uh, either receive a small stipend or you can have your expenses covered. And that's the bright line rule under state law on when these rules kick in, all of them do. Other questions? Yes? The question is, is, uh, is the end of the year party for commissioners uh, uh, the compensation you get? That certainly is part of the package. Other, in, it might fall into an exception too, for depending on who does donate to it. Oh yeah, it, 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 there's, like I said, I mean, California, as we all know, loves to write lots of different rules. And uh, you know, there's not only the government code, there's the FPPC regulations, and then you got attorney general's opinions, you got FPPC opinions, you know, there's a lot of paper out there on how these rules are applied. Um, other questions right now on the first half? Well, then maybe the best uh, announcement I'll make, and we'll take a 10-minute break. And so uh, please be back in here in 10 minutes. So we'll start, uh, well, let's say about 4.15 on the clock up there.
All right. All right, welcome back. Uh, we've gone over the first two parts of the training, which is personal financial gain and personal advantages um, and gains. And now we're gonna talk about transparency and then go into fair processes. So transparency laws. Uh, key principle is that everything you do for the city, it's the public's business and the public trusts a process it can see. We're gonna be talking about two main areas, the Public Records Act and the Brown Act. So the Public Records Act basically allows the public to review all city documents. And the core rule here is that you assume any document that involves the city is available to the public unless an exception applies. So that's where we start with the analysis because my office uh, and city clerk's office will review these when Public Records Act requests come in. And we start with the assumption if the city's in the possession of the record, it should be released unless an exception applies. And there's a lot of different exceptions that do apply. Um, and then we're gonna be talking about the Brown Act, which is the open meeting law. And that basically is California's sunshine law for meetings, which is that the public's business, the public should be able to watch. And so that's the point of the Brown Act. Public records. So what are they? Um, as I mentioned, anything that involves the city's business. So agendas and meeting materials, uh, other writings prepared, owned, used, or retained by the agency, including electronic, that includes emails. Um, and penalties can be, of course, bad uh, media attention, and then costs and fees uh, if the city gets a lawsuit. And as Lana had mentioned, uh, there's a lot of lawsuits that can be brought against the city for violating the rules that we're talking about today. Um, she'd referred to if someone brings a political reform act suit, you might have to pay the attorney's fees of the person who brings it if they win. In this case, if the city gets a lawsuit for a public records act request violation and the folks who bring the lawsuit win, then the city has to pay their attorney's fees too. So uh, it can be a big hit for the city. And it's not just oh, we didn't release a lot of records. Cities can get dinged for just a few records. So um, my hat's off to our city clerk, Dana, who's here right now. She deals with these Public Records Act requests uh, often on a daily basis, sometimes weekly, and it's a lot of heavy lifting on her end to go through all these documents. Um, public records also involve email, as I mentioned, and it can involve what you might think is your personal email. And this is important to remember. You'll be able to use city email accounts, but if you have a personal email account and you do city business on it, that becomes a public record. And so this went up to the California Supreme Court in 2017, where in the city of San Jose, it was a regular practice for city officials to use their Gmail, AOL, um, maybe they had an old Earthlink account, and they would do city business on that. And then when records requests came in for those emails, they said, well, that's not a city email account. And the California Supreme Court said, nope, turn them over. And so we recommend that you just use your city email account for all city business. If you do happen to use your private account, then forward that to your city email account or CC your city email account. Because then if you get the phone call or an email from Dana, city clerk, or someone else that a request has come in, if all of your emails are on the city server, then we can confidently search through those and you don't have to go through the mess of turning over Gmails or private email accounts. Yes, question? The question is, is that if uh, someone sends an email to a public official, should we assume the city has a copy of that email? Uh, based upon the city's record retention schedule, yes, until uh, the city is authorized under law to uh, basically clean up its emails or destroy the record. So to qualify as a public record, uh, writing must contain in some substantive way information relating to the conduct of the public's business because it's necessary and convenient to the discharge of an official's duty. Uh, it's a long-winded legal way of saying that basically any document or email involving the work you're doing for the city, uh, it's assumed to be a public record, 
And unless one of the exemptions apply, the public can look at it. Um, financial interest disclosure. Uh, this is something that involves your Form 700, which you fill out when you assume office, you do them manually, and you fill them out when you leave office. The whole point of this is just so the public knows what conflicts you might have, big conflicts on decisions you're making. And um, this is the, uh, something that everyone does in the state that's a public official and their public records. And it's an annoying paperwork bureaucratic process, I know. Uh, we fill them out too, Lana and I. Um, but it's something that you definitely wanna make sure you comply with. It's a really silly thing to get dinged on to not have them with the city clerk. Charitable fundraising, um, this is a rule that applies to elected officials, and this doesn't come up that often, but if you solicit a donation uh, from someone and it's over $5,000 and you're the one that basically is getting them to make the donation, that also goes on your Form 700, or what's well, an equivalent form, not the Form 700, but you have to report that as well. And um, if there's any questions about the Form 700, the city clerk's office, of course, can help you fill those out. Um, you have to report uh, sources of income, interest in real property, investments, et cetera, that are within the city's jurisdiction. So best practices um, on uh, the Public Records Act is assume that all information is public or it will become public and um, also uh, another uh, concept is don't be discussing agency business with fellow decision makers outside of meetings, and that's going to segue us into the Brown Act, which is the Brown Act wants to make sure that you are discussing the business of your commission, committee, board, or council in public when there's a majority of the folks that are having that discussion. So the Brown Act, uh, open meeting laws. Uh, we hear a lot about the Brown Act, it's thrown around a lot, you know, Brown Act this, Brown Act that, you know, this is a compliance with the Brown Act. People say, oh, you violated the Brown Act. Uh, it's a big deal for California. It is the core sunshine law. And the idea is that, according to the government code, all meetings of the legislative body, and that includes commissions, committees, or boards, of a local agency shall be open and public, and all persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of that body. Now, yes, question? Yes, actually the question was, does that include this training? That's a very good question because uh, every time this training is done, uh, you'll see that our city clerk diligently will file a notice of we're having a special meeting and the public can come in here right now. And um, yes, this is a public meeting. Um, I don't think any member of the public's ever shown up to one of these, but, oh, one time. City clerk says one time. Uh, Yes? I don't think this is, I don't think, oh. Question was whether or not uh, this is on television right now. Hello everyone, Bob Lloyd with AGP Video. If you see me or my cameras, yes, it is going on television. When you walk into a room full of microphones, beware, you could be recorded at any time. So be careful about walking up to these microphones and discussing business. So it's, uh, it's I, I try to protect you guys as best I can, but if you say something that's on camera or in session, it's there forever, but I cannot edit it. Well, there we go. We, we got a, a definitive answer on that. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. So conducting business at open meetings. Um, what does that mean? So we have that rule, but how does it apply? Well, as I'd mentioned before, a majority or a quorum of your commission, committee, board, or council can't consult outside of a properly noticed meeting open to the public on city business. And so the point of this is that you don't want to have a meeting where the chair says, let's discuss, and you just hear crickets, let's call a vote, boom, 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 the vote comes in, 4-1 or 5-0 or 3-2, and the public's like, well, what the heck? I mean, when did they talk about this? Oh, they talked about this at coffee, or they had dinner, or had drinks. No, you're supposed to discuss it at the meeting. Now, that applies to a quorum. So there's this concept uh, called linkage, where 
If you and another member of your committee, commission, board, or council want to discuss business of that group, uh, and it's with the minority of the group, then you can link yourself to that group, that other person, and talk about it. But as soon as he hits the majority, then that's a Brown Act violation. So be conscious of that, who you're quote unquote linking with. Question? So as a general rule, uh, if the action item is something that is pending and it also could be further acted on even after a decision, then you generally shouldn't be discussing it with the majority. So um, some decisions are one-time events and they're not going to come back. Other times you know that that subject matter is a reoccurring thing. So. That would be the answer. And the question was, is, uh, is there a time limit on when you can talk to a majority of your group, uh, commission, committee, board, or council? And the answer was what I just mentioned. Um, a key concept here is what constitutes a meeting. This includes serial meetings. So what that means is, and this often involves emails or texts, even social media, uh, Board member or commission member one and two are exchanging emails. Uh, a week later, you can't forward that email to a third commission member and have your opinions in there. That's a serial meeting. It's like a slow motion meeting. And this is something the law is adjusted to. It wasn't always spelled out. You can't do serial meetings. So finally, the law caught up with technology. Generally, technology always stays ahead of the law. and The law kind of clumsily catches up and technology keeps marching on. Well, this one now is in the law. Um, exceptions for certain kinds of events. Um, so the Brown Act issue is when you're actually having uh, discussion, deliberation, or action on city business. And so if you're at a social gathering or you're at a, a sporting event or you're just at a restaurant, uh, you can, under the Brown Act, all be there it's just you can't discuss, deliberate, or act on city business. So you can talk about the weather, you can talk about sports, um, but I would suggest the public perception of this is going to not look good because um, even if you aren't talking about city business, uh, members of the community would be like, well, why were they all there? Were they talking about something that they should have been doing at a meeting? Um, in addition to that, there's also some uh, clear exceptions um, the Brown Act, these rules won't apply um, when there's uh, conferences that are open to the public. I'd suggest you don't all sit together, but uh, you can go to conferences open to the public. And then public meetings organized by a person or agency other than the city that also are open to the public and address a matter of local concern. So the law recognizes that there might be conferences like, for example, um, you know, on some, some important regional issue, uh, they don't want to prevent a quorum from attending. Uh, you should intersperse yourself throughout the audience, though, is my suggestion. So what is a meeting? Uh, as I've been talking about, it includes any gathering of a majority of the members of the legislative body, and you're all considered legislative bodies, to hear, discuss, or deliberate upon any item within its subject matter jurisdiction. And I talked about how you can have serial meetings. Uh, you can also have intermediaries. So you can't be passing messages basically to other commissioners or council members um, about how you might vote or not vote or offer your opinion. Um, basically just the discussions need to be in the public. They need to be at the meeting. And the point is, is the public then has the right to know how you made your decision and they can comment on it as well. So meetings take place when a quorum receives information on, discusses, or deliberates any item on which the body may legally act. Uh, they must be held within the city. Um, as I've talked about, it applies to legislative and advisory bodies. 
And um, serial and rotating meetings or polling is prohibited. That's that slow motion meeting I was talking about. But social gatherings are okay under the law. Just be careful of public perception and don't talk about city business that involves your commission. Um, I talked about serial meetings. Um, this is just an example of two of the types. Uh, a chain where you know member A contacts member B, B contacts C, boom, you have a chain meeting or hub and spoke or one person is gathering the opinions of the other commissioners and then sharing them with all the other ones. Um, those would be considered Brown Act violations. Uh, AB 992, um, this is again the law catching up to technology. The law expressly references social media where if one of the commissioners or council members, board member, committee members is posting online their opinions and then somebody else goes and they post a response to that on that platform, and then a third person does, you could have a Brown Act violation. So don't be just directly responding to other members of your board, commission, committee, or council on social media. And then I talked about this briefly, what is not a meeting, uh, individual contact, public conferences, other agency meetings, uh, community gatherings, social gatherings. And this basically will become uh, um, something of historical value, hopefully, and we won't have COVID-23 coming up, but um, we've had the COVID-19 rules, which is that under the state of emergency, which the governor probably will be lifting at the end of this month, uh, if the city passed a resolution every 30 days, you could hold your meetings uh, all teleconferenced um, this actually is no longer effective in the city of Morro Bay because the council didn't pass what would have been its probably last AB 361 resolution last, last night. Um, so now we go to the new rules. So Sacramento has passed AB 2449, which basically allows limited teleconferencing for your boards and your bodies. Um, Gets a little complicated in some ways. I had to read through this government code a few times to get the understanding of it. Um, I wish Sacramento could just make these things simple, but nevertheless, here we go. Uh, if you have just cause or an emergency circumstance, then you can teleconference into your meeting, but it can't be a quorum. So if you got a five member uh, board or commission, only two of them can do this at any one meeting. If you have just cause or emergency circumstances, and I'll get into that, uh, you have to publicly disclose if anyone 18 years or older are with you at that room you're teleconferencing in, and you have to use audio and visual. So what's just cause? Yes, question? What happens when you... Then you don't qualify under uh, the government code to use teleconferencing. Yes. The question was, is what if you don't have bandwidth that allows you to do audio and visual um, in that case, uh, you wouldn't be able to use this teleconferencing option. So there's two ways you can do it under the new laws, AB uh, 2449, just cause or emergency circumstances. Uh, just cause, if you will, is the easy one, but you only get to do it twice a year. That is if you have to do caregiving, uh, you have a contagious illness, uh, physical or mental disability that can't be otherwise accommodated, or you're traveling on official business of the local agency or another state or local agency. You can do this twice per calendar year. And how do you do it? Uh, you basically let your body know at the earliest opportunity, including at the beginning of the meeting, so you would zoom in and say, you know, I'm here for just cause. And you gotta give a general description of the circumstances. Now you can do that twice a year and you just need to make the disclosures I talked about and you're okay. Emergency circumstances, you can do this more often. Uh, you can do it uh, up to three months out of the year or no more than 20% of the annual meetings. And also, if you have less than 10 meetings, only a maximum of two. Now, this one is basically for medical emergencies. Uh, however, your board or body has to approve it. So the other one, you basically just say, I'm using one of my two just cause uh, options and that's that. For this one, your actual body or board has to approve it. 
Um, there's a process for that. Uh, I know the city clerk distributed an email today on um, some of the details on this, and I had a brief memo. If you have any questions about using AB 2449, then uh, we're available to talk to you about the process to walk you through it. Um, but the basic idea is that you need a good reason and you can only use it for limited purposes. And also, um, if you have a quorum of folks doing that, then uh, the meeting can't be held. So it has to be the most two, generally speaking. Um, agenda requirements. So what goes on an agenda? Uh, you have to have a written agenda for each meeting, and you can't have action or discuss items that aren't on the agenda with some limited exceptions. And the advice is to stay on point. Um, there must be a reasonable period of time for public comment before or during consideration of the item. Um, and if there's an actual emergency, you can add emergency items. It's rare, though because the item had to have come to the attention of the city uh, after the agenda was posted, and so they got to go up 72 hours before, so you had, the city had to find out about it in less than 72 hours, and then there must be a two-third vote to do this. So I know Morro Bay has rarely done this. It's usually involved, uh, you know, is either the, when the COVID emergency started or when we had the storm recently, but it's very rare to have emergency items added to the agenda. Uh, these are the exceptions. Uh, you're supposed to only talk about or take action on agenda items, but you can do brief responses to questions that come up. Um, you can ask questions for clarification. You can reference the staff for more information, um, and you can request staff to bring back a report on the agenda at a subsequent meeting. Uh, generally speaking, you know, the rule of thumb is, is you got maybe a few minutes to uh, not have a discussion but to have a brief response, a statement, or a question to staff. But anytime you start discussing city business with your other commissioners or council members at a meeting, if it's not on the agenda, then that discussion uh, should cease. Otherwise, it's in violation of the Brown Act. Public participation in meetings. Uh, this question or this issue comes up a lot. Um, anyone can show up. Uh, you don't have to be a resident of the city. Uh, you can't require them to give their name. They don't have to fill out forms. Um, last night at the council meeting, we had someone who came up that said he didn't want to give his name. I uh, had reasons for that. Um, and the public also can record whatever's going on there. And the only time someone can be ejected from a meeting is if they're actually willfully uh, interrupting or, or, or uh, causing the meeting to not occur. And um, that just rarely happens. And frankly, when cities do eject public comment speakers or someone that is mildly interfering with the meeting, often the city gets a lawsuit and it drags the city through years of uh, court and it, um, it can just be very disruptive for the city and financially costly. There's a famous case that came out of Santa Cruz where somebody was showing up and saying very derogatory, nasty things to council members, but wasn't interrupting the meeting, just being very rude, and they kicked him out. Santa Cruz lost that case. There was one down in Costa Mesa in Orange County. Um, so basically, you're a public servant now. People got their three minutes, and uh, they can pretty much say whatever they want um, unless they literally are keeping the meeting from happening. Question? Yes, the question was, is can you only get three minutes? Um, except in rare cases, like when somebody is talking about an appeal and the presiding officer generally give you know, the appellant and the respondent a little bit more time. Uh, the rule of thumb, uh, case law is a little wishy-washy on this, but you have the right to talk at the meetings, and generally the courts say that you get one to three minutes, and then how much time is provided by city policy and procedure, and Morro Bay provides three minutes. When the three minutes are up, you're done. The presiding officer can give a little bit more time if the, in, in his or her discretion, though. Yes? Can, can several people allocate your three minutes? The question was is whether you can allocate your time to another speaker. No, you can't. Each person gets three, and that's that. Um, so what can people talk about at meetings? Um, Basically, the, the law says that they have the right to talk about anything within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. So it's not just stuff on the agenda. The way it's interpreted is that 
virtually everything is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city, theoretically. So, um, you know, cities uh, need to tread very lightly on saying, hey, that wasn't the subject matter jurisdiction of the city, so you can't talk about it. It's, it's almost unheard of for someone to say that public comment's not allowed because it's not the subject matter jurisdiction. Um, typically these days, uh, one can say anything involves subject matter jurisdiction reasonably. So sometimes there's closed sessions. It's very rare for anybody other than uh, city council to do these, but closed sessions is where the public doesn't have the right to hear the discussion. And there's four reasons for closed session, uh, real property negotiations, uh, litigation, labor negotiations, personnel matters. And the basic reason is, is that these discussions would disadvantage the city if they were made in public. Obviously, if the city's thinking of selling or buying land, we don't want the other party to know what the discussion is on you know, our bottom line, how much we're gonna start off the negotiations with. Litigation, needless to say, we don't want the other party showing up and hearing what the strategy is. And then for labor, uh, talking with the unions, of course, it's a negotiation. And for personnel matters, uh, there's privacy interests there involved. And um, sometimes it does go public, but generally speaking, initially at least, it's confidential. And in closed session, there's some other rules. You're not supposed to be discussing funds, funding priorities, budget, salaries, contract negotiations. And sometimes if a final decision is made, and that depends on how the law defines final decision, it has to be reported out in open session the decision made. But generally there aren't final decisions made in closed session. Uh, failure to comply with Brown Act, uh, the decision can be nullified. Uh, there can be criminal misdemeanors in extreme cases for intentional violations. Um, one of the keys to remember here is that there's this thing called cure incorrect which means that if somebody challenges the city and says there's a Brown Act violation, they have to give the city the opportunity to cure it, to correct it. So there's this cure and correct process where you can't just immediately go to court and sue the city over Brown Act. Um, if they think that there was an issue with the agenda, they gotta, within 30 days, send a letter to the city and say, you know, was this a Brown Act violation? Are you gonna fix it? The city has, uh, they have to do that within 30 days. Um, if it's just a general Brown Act issue, then they have to do it within 90 days. So the city has an opportunity to fix its mistake because generally when there's a Brown Act issue, um, you know, city officials work very hard and they're serious about their jobs. Um, it can just be a mistake. City fixes it and moves on. Um, there are cases though uh, where, you know, there, there have been Brown Act violations and it goes to court and uh, cities get dinged for it um, or there's some serious trouble that happens. That brings us to group four, fair process laws, which I will hand over to your assistant city attorney, Lana Lehman, and then we will wrap up. Okay, so uh, fair process. Fair process laws, what do we mean when we hear the term uh, fair process laws? You probably would be more familiar with the phrase due process. Uh, it, it's a constitutional principle that basically requires a decision maker to be fair and impartial when um, sitting as a decision making body um, and especially when you're sitting in what's known as a quasi judicial capacity. So there's two different hats that uh, officials can wear. Quasi judicial hat, which is where due process, a slightly higher uh, standard of due process applies or the legislative hat, where due process still applies, but not to the same full impact as it does with a quasi-judicial position or decision pending before you. So what's, what's the difference? The legislative role is where you are acting just like, just as, the, as it says, a legislature. You, you are creating rules of general ap application so think the adoption of an ordinance, um, the approval of a contract, or uh, the uh, a purchase of property. Uh, that's, you're not making an individual decision about an individual property or an individual person. 
That is the quasi-judicial role, where uh, it's, the matter involves the application of your generally applicable standards, say like your zoning standards, for example, and applies them to a specific situation. Uh, examples would be uh, discretionary land use permits, business licenses, and other similar actions in which a property interest is specifically at stake as, as, uh, in the decision-making process. So fair process laws, a due process, generally California's fair he uh, hearing laws are intended to protect against three kinds of different bias. Uh, personal interest in the uh, decision's outcome. Council members, commissioners, officials may not have a direct personal or financial interest in the decision's outcome. You can't have a conflict of interest. All of the, all of the conflict type of issues that Chris uh, talked about in the first part of this program. Secondly, personal bias. Uh, the decision maker must not demonstrate a personal bias against the application or the applicant that would be pending before them. Um, what, uh, the, we're not just talking about mere, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about this uh, project. I need to hear more information. That's fine, but personal, the personal bias issue becomes a real problem when firm statements are made before the hearing process is presented and closed. Uh, I would never vote for uh, John Jones' company. I, I don't care how good his work product is, I would never award a contract to, to that person, or I would never grant an application to uh, that company. Um, or uh, on a more broad general sense, I don't agree with, uh, I don't agree with clinics, period. And I don't want, any, I would never ever consider or vote in favor of anything that facilitates, say, a, a medical marijuana clinic or um, any type of, of clinic or shop or retail uh, uh, store that may uh, be controversial and you've made clear that your mind is made up before you even hear all the evidence at the hearing before you. That's, that's the personal bias um, issue. And then factual bias, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, a, it's actually a little bit easier to, to see. This is a version of the prohibition against ex parte communications. It generally occurs where an official receives information, has a factual, um, has a factual knowledge that is outside of the public generally, and that is outside of the public hearing, and is outside of what uh, his or her fellow uh, commissioners or, or body members know, um, and may either cause them to have a closed mind in terms of that, that factual, special factual knowledge that they have may cause them to have a closed mind one way or another in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of the hearing before they even walk in the door. With respect to ex parte communications, they're okay. They happen. Um, people come up to you all the time in the grocery store and they say, hey, you know, I have this pro project that I'm putting in an application. Uh, it, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think? I would very much caution you in that type of situation about telling them what you think. The best answer in that scenario is to tell them you can have an you can have an opinion, but make sure anything that you say during ex parte communications with applicants or developers or possible contractors with the city, make sure you tell them. I, I will make up my mind when I've heard all of the evidence to be presented at the hearing. I have to keep my mind open before the hearing, um, and so I, I, am un, I, I am undecided. I need to be fair and unbiased. So, um, could, uh, so case examples relating to uh, due process in the um, city of Fairfield case, Two council members refused to disqualify themselves from a hearing on an EIR for a proposed development, even though bo they both had previously publicly expressed disapproval of the project. 
That's that ex-party communication issue that I was talking about before. These two council members came out and said, I'm never, ever, ever going to approve that EIR. I don't, I don't care how good it is. Uh, it, it, it won't happen. The uh, court in that uh, Fairfield case determined that the applicants, uh, the project uh, before those, those uh, council members were deprived of a fair hearing. It had to be remanded, it had to be redone. In the Hermosa Beach case, uh, an applicant wanted to demolish a duplex and build a condo. The planning commission upheld it, but neighbors challenged it because the condo would block their view. A, one of the council members refused to recuse himself, even though he lived one block away. And by the way, it would have obstructed, the, the project would have obstructed his view as well. Uh, there is actually two issues here. First of all, very good chance that he had a uh, conflict of interest uh, per uh, part one of uh, this uh, presentation. And number two, he, he couldn't make a fair and impartial uh, uh, weighing of the project before him because the very manner in which he owned property near the project and it was uh, negatively impacted, even if not financially impacted, negatively impacted by the project uh, made him biased against it. In the Nasha case, uh, an applicant wanted to build a residential development went before the planning commission. One of the commissioners authored an article attacking the proposed development before the hearing, and, and really attacking the development before the hearing. The project was denied at the planning commission. It was appealed to the city council. City council, uh, it, uh, through some procedural steps, made it its way up to the courts. Court said, no, they were denied a fair hearing. You have to return it all the way back to the Planning Commission and they need to sit with an impartial panel um, and get a, a, fa a fair hearing. So uh, lessons to be learned, uh, don't, <coughs> don't be out advertising unobjective and biased viewpoints. Uh, you know, try to limit your discussions you know, before the meeting uh, or before any hearing. Of course, make sure you disqualify yourself if you have a conflict uh, of interest. Uh, with respect to uh, limiting your discussions or qualifying your discussions, if you have ex parte communications before the hearing, uh, remember what I mentioned before about you know, qualifying it with, well, I can't make a decision until I have all the facts that will be presented to me uh, at, the, at the hearing or at the meeting. Incompatible office prohibitions. Um, you can be disqualified from holding, a, if, if you hold two offices, you can be disqualified from holding one of those two offices. Uh, public offices are deemed to be incompatible if uh, there is any significant clash of duties or loyalties between the offices. And the dual office holding would be improper for reasons of public policy and either office exercises supervisory, auditory, or removal power over the other. Um, so for example, the mayor uh, could not also sit as a planning commissioner. Well, the mayor, actually any council member, has uh, uh, oversight over planning commissioners. So that, that would be an example of um, a, an incompatible office. Uh, and a, uh, an official who ho holds two public offices simultaneously with conflicting or overlapping functions. When I said audit, I meant that one office can like over, uh, overrule or oversight, uh, oversee the finances or the decision-making process of the other body. They can overrule it. They can remove members of that body, otherwise exercise uh, supervisory powers. And the ramification for having two incompatible uh, positions is that you forfeit the first position that you held. Uh, more uh, issues on fair process law. Uh, yeah, don't don't sit at the dais and render decisions over uh, over that involve your own family members. Hope, hopefully, that should be fairly obvious. 
Um, don't solicit campaign donations from city staff and employees or, <laughs> or, other, or, or other officials. Um, campaign contribution restrictions, just, just keep in mind the, um, the new uh, SB 1439 uh, restrictions and limits on making decisions that relate to a campaign contributor for a 12 month period uh, that Chris uh, spoke about um, earlier. Okay, competitive bidding requirements. This is a, a, a bit of a leap here with respect to due process, but it does derive from due process. The idea here is that uh, everyone has the right to compete fairly for uh, the city's business, to be treated objectively, and also that the competition in an, a competitive bidding process produces the best price for the taxpayers so it's supposed to be a, a fair and impartial proce uh, process uh, as your, uh, as uh, em either employees or um, officers with the city avoid poisoning the well uh, while a bidding process is ongoing. In other words, don't confer you know, special advantages or disadvantages to certain bidders uh, as that process is ongoing. Best practices, think fairness, merit-based, decision-making, be, obje uh, be objective, keep politics separate from your relationships with uh, city staff, um, avoid uh, making biased or committal statements uh, before you have a public hearing, Res and make sure that you reserve off your ability and express your ability to reserve off your capacity to uh, truly weigh the evidence as it will be presented at the uh, public hearing. Did you want the last part with the, with sure. the questions and answers? Or yeah. there's, there's lots of resources that we've provided a listing for um, in, the, uh, in the PowerPoint materials. Thank you, Lana. Um, and also just following up, uh, one of the slides uh, I wanted to clarify for uh, the due process, we talked about uh, being disqualified for uh, having bias. And then we had a quote up there, though, on a councilman has a right to state his views on matters of community policy and his vote may not be impeached because he does so. Um, the issue here is that, like I said, you don't check your First Amendment rights in at the door. Uh, you can talk about community issues, but if you have taken a firm stand on an issue where you're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity, then uh, taking that firm stand means that you're going to have to recuse yourself. So, um, but in general, you can talk about community issues. It's when it's quasi-judicial, you're acting like a judge, where you have to weigh the facts and apply a policy, not that you're creating new policy or new laws. Um, and also, uh, wanted to clarify on fair process laws. Um, yeah, you can't solicit campaign contributions from employees because you have direct supervisory control over them, and obviously that would be a conflict. Um, needless to say, uh, council members and uh, different politicians, they solicit campaign contributions anywhere they can get them, but you can't solicit them from your employees itself. Um, resources for further reading. Uh, yep, there's, uh, of course, a lot out there, and, uh, you know, this is one book here. Um, it's a local official's reference to ethics laws. Um, questions to ask. So in general, we've gone over a bunch of stuff here. We've gone over personal financial gain, which is, uh, we talked about bribery, which is an obvious one. Uh, conflicts of interest. Um, we went through that four-part FPPC test. We talked about uh, contracts and 1090 violations, Political Reform Act. And then we went to the second segment, which is personal advantages and gains, which is perks, gifts, misuse of public funds, mass mailings, again, Political Reform Act. We talked about transparency, which is uh, Public Records Act, Brown Act, Political Reform Act disclosure. And then we talked about fair processes, which uh, um, your assistant city attorney Lana just talked about, which is bias, due process, incompatible offices, competitive bidding. Um, so those are all the laws, and we want you to think about those. And also, I think we can all hear the music next door right now. So uh, we are getting to close time. They started up early, um, but you have some little entertainment now. Um, so those are all the different laws we talked about. But what would make the public feel best, inspire the public confidence? 
Um, that's ultimately what you want to look at globally. And also a good test is, is what would you want to read about on the front page? So ask yourself, decision you're making, actions you're taking. If you're comfortable with it being on the front page of the Slow Tribune, then it's probably okay. If you think I don't want it on the front page of the newspaper, then there might be some questions. And ultimately, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, nobody's getting into being a public servant for the pay, that's for sure. I mean, you're doing this as a public service in the first place. And at some point, you're not going to be a commissioner, you're not going to be on the council and committee or a board. How do you want to be remembered? And so that's also something I think to think about when you're making these decisions. Um, as I'd mentioned, if you want to get anonymous advice, you can call the FPPC. Uh, you don't have to give your name or where you're from or the issue. Um, if you want a formal opinion or something substantive, then yeah, they're going to want to know how to contact you. Um, Institute for Local Government is also a good one, League of California Cities, and then of course, City Attorney's Office and City Hall. And key lessons, uh, the law sets minimum standards. Uh, violations of these laws can create, obviously, stiff penalties that we talked about. When in doubt, send it out, ask, and ask early. And it's your choice how high you want to set your sights above the minimum requirements of these laws. And so hopefully you've gotten just a general sense of what the minimums are, and then also ethical issues that you'll be faced with as a public servant. And now, as we can tell by the music, we have reached the end of our uh, two-hour session. Thank you for being here. Uh, City Clerk Dana Swanson has certificates for you, and turn those in, please. And um, thank you all, and I hope you have a great afternoon. And I'm available for questions if anybody has any.